one of our ambassadors for this year. So Cassie joined us in January. And uh, Cassie's a fantastically interesting lady. She's got lots of lots of interesting things to talk to us about today. So today we're going to be covering all sorts of topics. Um, so Cassie, tell us a little bit about your story, where you're at right now, because I know you live down in Cornwall with a small holding and a fabulous varied life, don't you? Yeah, no, um, I'm really lucky. So basically we moved to Cornwall. I was in my second year, of, first or second year of uni. My parents decided to escape to Cornwall. Um, we had some family down here, so they decided to escape from where we were living um, up near um, Stoke and Church, so Marlow, Henley Way. Um, and they decided to get away from the oil industry and to move to Cornwall. So they found a perfect little house um, in Cornwall in the middle of nowhere with only like three other houses around it um and perfect loved it moved in and then found out that the guy next door works for bp so it wasn't quite the escape um from the oil industry that my parents were hoping <laughs> but um it's ironic really and it, it's beautiful down here we've been down ever since so i've probably been down here for probably coming up 18 years or so um it's beautiful it's much slower um way of life down here which is much better for my mental health um because I think as much as I miss home and I miss everybody, um, I can still go and see everybody at the shows and catch up with everyone. And then I can come back here and it's all quieter and it's just perfect for my mental health, really. So, um, so yeah, so we were based originally up in um, Buckinghamshire. So on the Buckinghamshire Oxfordshire borders. Um, and I was lucky enough to learn to ride at Turtle Valley Stud, which is probably one of the most amazing starts that anyone could have had in their life I was I'm very very lucky um I started riding there from a four-year-old and I think I left well I bought my horse probably I was uh, 14 or so but I think I kind of eventually left when my parents moved down here I think they finally got rid of me I kept going back I was a bit like a bad penny <laughs> and um now luckily Diane Sam and Baker comes down here once a month um and she teaches so she still hasn't quite got away with for me and and we went on our honeymoon up there as well so they don't really get away from us but um it's um it's just the most heavenly place if you've never ever been um to Turtle go to Turtle it's just it's just perfect and you get a lot of filming done there so the Vicar of Dibley was filmed there and um Goodnight Mr Tom and all of those you know Avengers and things like that was all filmed in that area and it's just the most beautiful place you will ever see um but unless you've won the lottery you can't afford to live there <laughs> So, you, want to, you want to be careful because we're all going to start coming down to you now, Cassie. That's it. You're going to have a mass exodus. Uh -huh. Mind you, you do every summer anyway, don't you, down there? You have a mass exodus oh. of people coming. Well, they're trying now. <laughs> I mean, you're meant to be on lockdown and they're still trying to come to Cornwall. Oh, but no, we, it, is, it is beautiful down here. We're really lucky. We live right at the bottom of Hamlet Tor. So it's on like conservation land and it's just stunning. I mean, there's lots of granite around, um, but it is, it is beautiful. Um, and... You know i'm truly blessed we're very lucky that we live um on my parents property so we've got a, a converted barn literally five meters that way um so we're very very lucky it's only a one bedroom and there's four of us and two dogs but it's you know it's a squeeze but <laughs> at least we all get on um but yeah it, tell us it's great tell us about your also. brood then tell us about your your family your kids your animals your ponies what have you got down there in your your well little... We've got um, the, the two dogs, obviously, came first. They are um, Ruby and Amber, our two spaniels. Um, Chris, actually, I gave Chris Ruby as his engagement present. Um, one of our friends has just got engaged recently and her, her other half is desperate now to get a spaniel puppy <laughs> because he thinks this is how it works. <laughs> but, yeah, that was a good excuse for getting Ruby. Um, and then, of course, she was lonely, so we had to get Amber, you see. So, you know, now we've got the two of them, so they work really well together. But, um, and then we've got the girls, we've got Tilly, Tilly is 12, um, and then we've got Lottie, Lottie is three, going on 23, I think. She is um, a force to be reckoned with, but they're both fabulous girls, so Chris is totally outnumbered at home. The only male he has in the family is our Ram, who is about 300 years old, um, and he's the only kind of entire male thing here, so he won't let me send him away anywhere because he's his only man friend. <laughs> so they go off and they have little chats in the field. <laughs> and, they, and and they sit and they they have man time together. So yeah, he'll hate me for saying that, but that's his um, that's his only male buddy because he's pretty much outnumbered by the rest of us. Even most of the horses 
and and even the male horses that we've got here are castrated so he's pretty stuffed with that really so yeah adam is his um adam is his only friend um, oh. So tell us about your horses then, Cassie. What have you got? Because I know you've always had part breads rather than full bread Iberian horses. And we were discussing before we came online the uh, the merits of a part bread horse and things. <laughs> well, I mean, I, if I, I have been very lucky to have a purebred Lusitano um, before Vento Fresco. He was bred by a good friend of mine, Lucinda Wynn, and she breeds the most fabulous horses and he was just the best horse ever he's now living with a fantastic family up in Hereford way um I hurt my back quite badly and he ended up um I wasn't able to work him so I ended up selling him um and he's gone on to be fantastic and he still loves pieces and he's a real family family um you know strong one with them um but I actually started with a part bred Lusitano um maestro the the maestro who is has been part of my life probably longer than anybody um probably than my you know other than my parents um I was he was I think he was born when I was about 10 9 or 10 and it was one of those ones again where the poor guys at Turbo were trying to keep me away and I kept going in with the stable with this youngster and I kept going in the field with this youngster and they kept saying to me you know it's not safe you know you've got to be careful with these young horses and I was only little and I just there's something about him. I just was drawn to him. Um, and then when he was four, um, somebody came and showed some interest in buying him. And um, Angela, that owns the yard, very kindly said to my mum, oh, we've got somebody interested in him. So if you want him, you're going to have to buy him. Um, so we ended up getting him probably very inappropriately as a four year old um, for a 14 year old. was probably not the best. Um, but do you know what? It turned out to be fabulous. We did everything together. We did pony club, we did polo, we did hunting, we did cross country. We dressed up to medium. Um, the breeder always said to me, you know, he's never going to be the best of the best. He's not going to be a really strong breed, um, you know, stamp, but actually he'll do you really well. And he did. He was fabulous. We won um, the ridden um, part, the ridden part road class at the Lucy Breed Show one year at Addington. Um, under Sylvia Locke I was so proud um, he was just fabulous we had such a good time together and we lost him he was 21 and we lost him to um, atypical myopathy um, uh, not very many years ago four years ago I think it was um, and he is buried in the garden because he's a pet that's what the vet said <laughs> so we can get away with it but he's still in our garden hence the fact that we can never move because he's here and he has his own you know thing here and even my dad who's 87 said to me the other day I don't want any big promotion I just want to be buried with the horse so they're going together apparently in the garden <laughs> so he's um he is part of our family and we walk past him every morning and every morning we say morning mice you know he he really taught me a lot and I am forever grateful to the guys at Turbo for breeding him because he was just the most amazing horse and I was um sat with him yesterday and talking to Lottie my daughter and saying to her you know, it was a bit real shame because she never got to meet him and she could have ridden him because he was just so, so beautiful. Um, but yeah, so he was the real reason that I got started with the Lusitanos. Um, he was only a part bred, but he was still fabulous. And I used to ride his dad. Um, I was lucky enough to have lessons on his father, Ambassado, who actually only passed away a few years ago. Um, they are just the ultimate four by four. These horses are, they're a bit like a sports car with four wheel drive. That's the best way that I can explain them. The difference between the Lusitano and the Spanish horses, as far as I'm aware, is that they were both very similar breeds. They were both the same breed back in history. Um, and they were designed really for bullfighting and for working in the fields with the cattle. Um, and then one of the princes, I believe, back in, I don't know, 1600s or something, was killed um, in a bullfight. So the king ruled out any bullfighting. So the horses of Spain then went on to do a lot more fairer. So they became um, a little bit more um, for showing, you know, showing off the beautiful, you know, way of the horses moving, the way the confirmation is, etc., and showing their horses off in parties like the the Spanish like to do. Whereas the Portuguese kept on bullfighting and then they kept on working the horses in the field. So the horses in Portugal, the Lusitanos. Um, from my understanding, are still very much more sporty-like, if that makes sense, rather than being, you look at the Spanish horses, they tend to be very big, very flamboyant with lots of hair. Um, and although you can get the Lusitanos like that, they tend to be a lot more sports-like. 
they are the ultimate sports horse. Um, you hear lots of people saying, well, I've got a sports horse, I've got a sports horse. But actually, I tell you what, if you compared a lot of those horses to a Lusitano, a Lusitano can pretty much do anything. They can dressage up to Grand Prix. They can show jump. I mean, John Whitaker used to show jump a horse called uh, Noviero many years ago. Um, and he was actually the grandfather of my horse that I ended up selling. Amazing, amazing horse. Um, was one of his derby horses because it was so fast. Um, you know, they drive, people drive them. Uh, Boyd Excel, I believe, had um, on some of his indoor teams. Um, they're just so quick and they're so clever to learn. Most stunt horses that you see are Lusitanos because they're clever. Um, you know, you don't have to teach them so many times, you know, they really get it. So um, they are the ultimate four by four, which is why I have to say that, you know, although people love the Spanish horse and they talk about the Paris, um, I like the Spanish horses, but the Lusos do hold a real special part in my heart for that reason, because they are really true to their their roots. Um, and that's why I got into a working rotation, really, because um, when I was at Turville, um, Diane and Becky and Marcia and some of the other ladies there, they all um, got onto the one of the teams, one of the first teams that went out um, to, I think it was the European Championships. Um, and we'd never really heard of it before and it was great. So as a, a young groom, I was able to, um, you know, help with the obstacles and, and start to learn this discipline from um, watching these, these great riders um, compete. And then I've always kept my kind of toe in the water slightly with it. I've not really, I've not competed. I did a little bit with Maestro, but I've always watched it and always kind of been interested in training it, et cetera. Um, and then since the association has been taken over by um, Georgia uh, Schoen and Paolo Santos, um, I've been a lot more involved in it um, because this couple have just worked so hard to really make sure that it sticks to the rules um, because like I know you said before when you spoke to Emma a lot of people see it as a um, almost like an, um, an alternate alternative to trek or they see it slightly as a handy pony thing this discipline is really tough when you um, you know you speak to a lot of the Portuguese riders on the international team in the dressage team a lot of them have come from a working equitation base and if you say to them would you rather ride the international working equitation test in an advanced level or would you rather do a Grand Prix test? Most of them would say a Grand Prix test because it's easier. <laughs> because trying to ride your horse through the dressage, the ease of handling and the speed with one hand in with the ultimate precision, which these guys are so, you know, they're so perfectionist, they, they have to get it right. So, you know, it's tough, it's really tough. And um, because the horses have to be sharp, they have to be reactive, but at the same time, they have to be submissive. So it's not always easy, but um, it just is a sport that inspires me. I love it. Um, and it just every time I watch it or I see somebody having a go, whether they're right at the beginning at the walk and trot level or if they're up at advanced, it just makes my heart fill, you know, and I just I've got a real buzz for it. So it's um, it's a great sport. So I'm very lucky that travel has helped me right from the beginning to to where I am now. Cool. So tell us a little bit more then about your ideas around coaching it and, and what you love to do. And, and maybe even tell us a little bit about how you would coach someone who's, say, never done it before. OK, so I really like working with the novice uh, riders. I start with people right at the beginning, um, probably more because it's my comfort zone, because I'm riding young horses um, and horses that are particularly trained past medium at the moment. So. Um, I'm not working with the advanced horses myself, so therefore I feel comfortable teaching people who are um, starting their journey with it. Um, now, the great thing about this sport is that anybody can do it. Anybody can have a go. Um, you can um, you can do it with your hairy cob. You could do it with your dressage horse. You can do it with whatever you want to. Really, you could come along with a donkey if you wanted to. But you you have a go. Um, and what we tend to do is, is like I said to you, there's three, three phases at the moment at a normal regional. So you would have the dressage phase. Now, the great thing about the dressage phase is there is only one test per level. <laughs> so for those people that are going, oh, God, I've learned prelim 14 and I was meant to do prelim seven. Yeah, don't worry. <laughs> if you're doing the walk and trot test, you're just doing a walk and trot test. You don't have to worry about which number test it is. So. That's probably the, the first thing because people go, oh, God, dressage, you know, but it's in a 20 by 40 arena. You don't have to worry about any of the other scary letters that people can never remember where they are. Um, 
you've literally got your normal letters and it's a 20 by 40 arena and it's a, a nice basic straightforward dressage test so you have a walk and trot level you have the the novice then you do um you have into b um and into a now because they used to just have one intermediate level but it was a little bit like jumping from novice dressage to psg it was quite a big jump so they've put in a, a like an elementary medium level in the middle um then you've also got your into bit your into a um, and then you've got your advanced. You've also got your junior test as well. So you've got your, um, I think you've got your juniors and your young, young riders, but um, I'm not 100% on which is which. So we have to have a little look at that. But um, I would recommend that if you've got a child wanting to do it, come in and start a walk and trot and novice, because if you looked at the junior test, you might actually cry because it's got pirouettes and flying changes and all sorts of things in it, which might scare you off. So um, just come in and have a go at the basics. So your dressage test is first. Um, then we come in on a normal, like a regional day, and we do um, a course walk. Now, the great thing about it is that the course for the ease of handling. So the ease of handling is what you might assume is the obstacles. Um, and you have the obstacles, but they're ridden and marked like a dressage test. So you will find that um, the judge will walk the course with you, which is great, because if you've never done it before, you can pretty much come around every single obstacle and say, OK, so I can go from here to there and just double check everything out. I would really recommend that when you walk the course, um, actually walk it like you're going to ride it. Don't stand in the middle and go, oh, that one, then this one, then that one. up. doesn't help. Open the gate, you know, go round the pen, walk it yourself. Um, so can you so just can you just clarify? You walk it with the judge? Yeah. So you yeah. walk the course with the... In what sport do you walk <laughs> the course with the judge? And I take it you're allowed to talk to the judge? Yeah, yeah you, wow. can ask, you can ask questions. So it's a really good... It's brilliant. And it's so that's where I love it, because it's so welcoming, because, um, you know, like you say, you wouldn't get that in other things. The judge is seen as being this scary person. Um, but, yeah, you can walk the course with the judge and with the working expectation, like a bit like jumping, you're not meant to cross your line. So, for example, if you had to the slalom is a line of five posts um, upright, um, about seven metres apart. And say, for example, that takes up quite a lot of the arena and you have to get across that to be able to get to another obstacle. Now, obviously, if you've got a massive arena, you can go around it and you've got, you can wait, work your way around it. But if your arena is quite small, in some cases, once you've done the slalom, you might need to then cross it to get to another obstacle. Um, so what you can then do if you're not quite sure and you think, oh, actually, I can't get around there. You can say to the judge, OK, once I've completed that, am I allowed to cross that obstacle to get to the next one and they will clarify for you whether they are happy for you to do that or not so because I know like Emma said to you it is so easy to get eliminated I have been eliminated more times <laughs> the amount of times that I finished on my dressage score is embarrassing really um but, but it is usually because I've taken a young horse and they've gone oh god I can't do the bridge or I can't do the gate so <laughs> it, it happens to us all but um yeah, so if you have a chat with a judge on your way round and walk it, you know, with the other riders and ask the more experienced riders, that's the best thing. You know, if you've got one of the more experienced guys walking with you, ask some questions, you know, say to, okay, well, how would you get around there or how am I going to get the best marks to come around? Everyone's lovely and everyone's really friendly. I mean, they might not do that to you as an international, but obviously when you're starting off and you're just doing a normal regional, then um, everyone's really friendly and they'll help you out. So that's, um, that's really lovely. So um, one question I've got then, just while you pause and take yeah. a breath, because <laughs> you know so much about it, it's really, it's fantastic to hear what you're saying. So let's say um, I wanted to start learning about it and I haven't got a lot of equipment or a lot of kit yeah. and certainly don't have a bridge um, and things like that. How would you say that someone could start maybe getting into this? What's the best way? Okay, so the best thing to do is to have a look at the Association of Working Expectation uh, page. They've got a Facebook page. Um, you can also have a look at their website and find a trainer local in your area. Obviously, when this lockdown's over, um, find a trainer in your area, local to your area, um, and get in touch with them because what they'll be able to do is be able to give you um, a bit of a, a taster course, maybe, or they go to a session and have a little play, and then you can come home and make things yourself. So if you get in touch with the Working Education Association, they actually have uh, printed something called the um, the handbook now it's pretty much like my bible I have one and it goes it's very tatty and it goes everywhere with me and it's amazing because um the Georgia and uh, Holly Barber work really closely together to make this amazing handbook and it pretty much gives you every obstacle the size the width the distance apart it needs to be and um, how you ride it how you would get better marks than how you get um you know less marks it, it's pretty much a bible and it takes you through 
um, the dressage test and also the obstacles and it's got um, everything in there that you need. I don't think they're that expensive. I think they're about 12 quid or something. So get in touch with the Working Excitation Association. That's the first thing that I would say to do and, and get yourself a handbook uh, if they've got some printed because they are just brilliant. And that will be your starting point really because you'll be surprised what you've got at home. You know, you don't need a bridge. I just got a piece of old ply board um, to begin with. Um, you can use a bit of tarp just to get them used to walking over something. It's more the sound, it's the hollow sound. So the ply board is brilliant. Um, but things like, um, I've got flower pots. I bought some flower pots in Asda. I filled them with a bit of topsoil and stuck a, one of my mum's bamboo canes in the top. And that's what I used for my slalom. She still hasn't worked out that I've stolen them, but it's fine. I've had them for about a year. <laughs> but I've, uh, I've got all sorts. Then my Vara. So um, I used a, a piece of dowling mod from being cute, which was about two and a half metres long. I've got my own Vara now. Um, when the juniors went over to Portugal, they brought um, a load back in the lorry, which is great. So I've got my own. But um, yeah, that, that was fine for, you know, to train with or a broomstick. You know, you can, a broom handle, you can, you can use anything really. I've got oh, a fair... So you're talking about the pole that you carry? Oh, yeah. Uh... So that's the Vara. So so, you know, you can use that. Um, that's, you know, that's that's perfect. I've got a bell, which was about a pound from a local hardware shop that I've um, just cable tied the end of. And I've made um, like a, you know, like two um, long plastic electric fence posts. Yeah. You know, like, the, you know, where the ends snap off and things. But what I've done is I've taken the ones where the ends have snapped off. I've just cable tied them together like a T. And then I put my bell on the end of the, the T section so I can attach it to a fence. So when I go away and train, it fits in my car um, and then I can just tie it on with a good old bit of baler twine. You don't have to have an amazingly made bo uh, bell, you know, and all this sort of stuff. I pretty much make everything so it fits in my car because when we go training, it has to fit in my car. Um, even the bull that uh, my very <laughs> my very kind friend Shelley made, um, I think she got a little bit carried away because he's pretty massive. But she, um, out of flyboard, she made me um, a bull. He's called Ferdinand. And um, he didn't fit in my car. So he's had an operation recently and now he does fit in my car. <laughs> so he's had, um, he's been chopped in half and now he folds. Um, and we, he folds up and goes in my car. I mean, that's the main thing that you're going to see at a working equitation competition that you probably don't have at home is a cut out bull. Um, so if you can make something to get them used to that, fantastic. But most other things you'll have at home, poles, um, you'll have uh, a bit of rope. I just use a really long um, lead rope to work for the gate. And then I use my normal gate as my um, practice one for your fixed gate. Um, barrels, all sorts of things that people just have anyway. Um, you can use jump rings, you can use flower pots, anything. Just, you know, when you're out hacking, you don't even have to have a school. When you're out hacking, just go out and practice, you know, opening and closing the gates. Um, if you have a little look on my page, I often share um, little hints and tips of how to do things and just have a little look and then practice when you're out hacking and just have a go because you'll be surprised. Most of the things that you you do in working equitation are from the field anyway. So there will be things that you will see when you're out hacking anyway. So that's probably the, the best thing. But get in touch with the association first because they're, they're going to be able to give you a list of um, trainers in your area. OK, so having heard lots about this now, and I know you mentioned it earlier, um, so there's like a dressage phase to it, there's like an obstacle phase to it, and then there's, a, what was the third phase? The speed. The speed phase. So um, that does sound very similar to Trek. Yeah. Um, certainly the Trek where you don't, where you, um, I think they call it, um, oh, I can't think of the name of it right now, but the, um, the one where you don't go off and do the orienteering part, they replace that with a dressage test. Um, I think it's called versatile horse, they call it. Yeah. So what, what would you say is different? It, I don't know how much you know about it, but you must, you must sort of have an idea of what the difference between working equitation is and, and maybe track. Um, because obviously people might be sat here now thinking, well, it's the same thing, isn't it? You know, what, what would you say the differences and why why do you prefer working equitation? Why did you get into that rather than, than track? Um, that's a really, really good question, actually. I've never I've never done trek myself, um, but I've got lots of people who are very good at working equitation because they're very good at trek. Um, I've, you know, some of the most interesting riders I've had recently um, come through and they've just picked it up like that is because they're trek riders. So um, you know, the, the trek has really, really helped them with the obstacles. The difference with the working equitation that I would say is it's more for your dressage rider. So if you are trying to 
um, if you're trying to perfect the way that your horse um, does an obstacle, um, it's about the approach. So your balance, your rhythm um, of your approach, your transition, you know, the, the submission in the transition, can the horse remain true and soft and balanced in the transition, um, hold itself, you know, use the core strength to be able to hold itself up so that you can maintain it. Things like, um, it's not just about doing the obstacle, it's about um, how you approach it. It's about how you carry the obstacle out and how you leave the obstacle. So showing the bend, can your horse bend? Can your horse do a walk pirouette? So for example, the pen, um, you would come in at the lower levels, you would come back to walk for the pen. So you have to be able to say you can to approach it, you can trot it if you want to, but you would normally canter approach it, transition to walk. So you're looking at the canter to walk transition. Um, and then you're looking at a clear four beat rhythm in the walk as you're coming around the pen. So you're asking the horse to go into an area that sometimes is just poles on the ground. At other times it is, um, sometimes we use those uh, road work barriers. So it is an enclosed area. So the horse can often back off and be a little bit unsure, come slightly behind the leg. So you're asking the rider to be able to say to the horse, come on, this is fine, we can do this. And you're encouraging the horse to maintain the rhythm through whilst keeping the bend, lifting through the core. And then as you come out of the pen, you then ask the horse to do a walk pirouette. So they're looking for the horse to then, again, maintain the core strength, come around, do the walk pirouette correctly. Most horses like to pivot. They do a half, they do like a, a half a turn on the forehand, a half a turn on the haunches, and people go, oh, it's turned around. Okay, so you can start with that and then you build from there. But again, you're looking at the continuation of the rhythm in the walk pirouette. Then you would go back in again and you would show the uh, pen the other way. In the canter, when you're working at the higher levels, you're looking at the horse being able to come in in canter, canter out, you know, come come round the pen in the canter. Now the pen, the pen is only six meters; it's not big, so it's a it's a small area to be able to maintain a good rhythm in the canter. Okay, and then you'd come out, you'd then do the flying change, and then you do the canter pirouette, half canter pirouette, back in again, <laughs> and then you do the the six meters the other way. So it, it's as you go up the levels, it's tough. And then when you do it at advanced level, you do all of that, but you do it one-handed. <laughs> so, so which is why I was trying to explain to you earlier that a lot of the Grand Prix riders would rather ride the Grand Prix test than ride the advanced working equitation test because it's tough. So, you know, I don't want to scare people and, you know, they think, oh, I can't count a pirouette, I can't do a flying change. And that's why, you know, you start right at the beginning, you come in at walk, and it is very similar to the trek when you first start out. But don't be don't be kind of uh, fooled. It's not easy. People come along and they go, I had a lovely time playing with my horse and having a great time with the obstacles. That's fantastic. You know, and if that's what you're trying to achieve, just a bit of a bond with you and your horse and asking the horse to move away from your leg and getting it to understand when you want it to move sideways along a pole. Fantastic. But if you're really serious about this sport, you can go all the way because you will be able to do. I mean. Uh, Lynn McLeod that owns um, that owned Sparky that Emma had Emma had sorry um, she has got a beautiful horse that she rides now for somebody and the that is a massive great warm blood it's huge um, and its canter was really really big and I've watched her over the last year or so because she's on the squad I've been watching her progression and every time I watch her canter now I just think oh I'm not worthy it's <laughs> she's managed to make this horse that cantered so big you know, canter so elegantly, but it doesn't look like it's scrunched up. It doesn't look like it's tight. It doesn't look like it's it's tense at all. It just flows, but he just canters much shorter because of the working equitation training. The changes, the flying changes on it are just, you know, her and, and Paolo have worked really, really hard. Um, and I'm totally, definitely not worthy of this. You know, she's fantastic to watch. But, um, you know, there's people that you can watch and aspire to be. So, the difference between the track, I would say, and the working equitation is that if you want to take it further, it is really based on the dressage. Um, and this is why we're going to get Jane into having a go, because um, I think her amazing Tom, who is just gorgeous, um, is going to be fantastic because he's really clever. Um, and, you know, he, Jane was saying how, how clever he is, how quirky he is. Um, and those horses just love to use their brain. And the great thing about working equitation is it gets them thinking, it keeps them supple, it gets them regular in the rhythm, um, and it just really, really gets them working with you. So they're not preempting what's going to happen next. A perfect example of that is Nikki um, that you spoke to the other day with Fred. 
Fred is one of these horses that is so good at, he's read the book, he's got the manual, um, and he's already worked it out before Nicky's asked him the question, and he's decided that he's doing it. Um, and he was fantastic. We we did a little bit, we did a, a normal less dressage lesson with her before the working expectation clinic at hers, and then she, you could see she was desperate to come back in and have a play. So she came in and had a go, and he was just fantastic. And after that, she said, oh, this is just great, you know really loved it and we've been using some of the working expectation exercises to help improve her changes as well so um you know you, i think anybody you don't have to necessarily compete obviously it's great fun if you do compete because everyone's so lovely and they they're good parties with good food lots of alcohol good fun um but um i think if you want to use the working expectation in your training um you're not going to do any harm to horses at all it's gonna you're only going to improve everything so it's, it's well worth having a look at Cool. Thank you for that. It's, it's hugely interesting to hear all about it. And, and also to, to hear that. So the Jane that you're referring to is Jane Turney, who's yeah. whose little pony, Tom, um, I think Tom's 14 too, isn't he? Yeah. And and he, she's aiming for Grand Prix with him. I think she's PSG with him at the moment. And well, she did the, did the Inter 1, didn't she, at the regionals? Right. So yes. She... Okay. Yeah, yeah. So she's into one with him. Fantastic. Um, and so that will be really, that will be so much fun to follow. We'll have to make sure we get some videos and bits and pieces of their journey. That will just be so nice for people to see that he, he's, you know, he's a very flashy little pony and he's certainly not a kid's pony. That's why she said she got him. And in fact, we've got Jane coming on in a couple of weeks. So she'll tell us all about Tom. Um, but yeah, I mean, how wonderful is that to think that actually a dressage rider could be doing something like that to help improve their dressage. And it's fun for the, for both of them. That's really cool. Yeah, I think um, if I'm if I'm right, I remember that the association took um, work, some of the working. I think they took the squad to um, the is it the Premier League at Hickstead last year, um, and they did a demonstration in the gala. I think, um, and I remember a couple of the riders with it, Andrew Gould and a couple of the others had a go afterwards, and I don't think they found it as easy as they thought it was. <laughs> I think they found it a lot harder. So. Um, uh, Holly's Holly Barber, um, our leading lady rider, her little horse, Ashbata, is just phenomenal. And I think one of them had a go on him and they suddenly realised that riding this little pocket rocket was not as easy as they thought it was going to be. So um, they, you know, they do make it, the guys make it look effortless, but it really isn't effortless. It's, um, but it's great fun. It's really good fun. And you have to just break it down. So just have some fun with your horse and you go at the speed that you want to go at. So I'm doing it with a Clydesdale cross, you know, so... I have not got a Lusitano to do it with at the moment. I've got a, a four-year-old and a three-year-old Lusitano cross at the moment, um, neither of whom are, you know, working at quotation at the moment, but the Clydesdale cross that I've stolen off my friend, um, she loves it. She's amazing because she's another one that's really clever um, and always has an idea that she knows what she's doing before I've even asked her. Um, so the working expectation for her is just fantastic because it stops her thinking about everything else and really makes her focus on, what we're doing because actually she doesn't know what's coming next so we she's got to focus and it just does it, it really does improve her rhythm and her balance and she's a big horse to get round so um you can do with any breed any breed it sounds like it'd be a fantastic thing to do with um show jumpers and eventers as well if you want them listening to what it is you're really telling them because they don't know what's coming up next maybe less with the show jumpers but certainly with the um eventers for the cross country phase it sounds like it would be a, a fantastic thing to get their brains engaged and really waiting and listening for you yeah i think um last year i think they took the guys to um is it aston la walls i think that's a cross country venue isn't it um, and they did a, a competition up there and they used um, some of the jumps So they used, uh, it, it, they put them in optional, but they had steps and they had logs and some of the water. So they actually, in the ease of handling phase, which is the obstacle phase, um, obviously not the one that's jumped like a dressage chest, sorry, judged like a dressage chest. They included some of the cross country obstacles to that as well. So, you know, it's a really good way you can, you can have fun and play with it. It doesn't all have to be boring in an arena. They sometimes they go out and they use the express eventing force. Um, but it's, I mean, most people get into working education because of the speed, because they see the speed, but we don't train the speed. I don't train the speed with any of my riders, um, purely because I think you can undo a lot by just trying to go fast. I'd rather teach them to um, pick up, um, you know, so to almost lose time in, in between the obstacles. So like you would do if you're doing a jump off, you know, instead of going all the way around, then maybe cut through and maybe push on a little bit if you've got time between obstacles but don't rush your obstacles themselves because I think you're just going to do more damage 
to the horse's confidence in you um if you if you push the obstacles too fast obviously the guys at the top level can 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 train that but I don't think I think the squad the squad also kind of really works on the accuracy because the accuracy is what helps you at the end of the day not the going fast cool that's brilliant and I think it's lovely to hear as well that then there's even ways to think about it and you know get competitive in different ways and things as well I think that's that's fantastic so coming on to something else that you do a lot with and I think sort of leading into that was the fact that you were talking about um you know how they do certain moves about the core about the strength about the you know the elevation being able to use the body and doing it for um um the accuracy over speed is that you do quite a lot in hand work with horses and things as well don't you and i know you're producing a video series at the moment on things you can do in hand with your horse which is particularly useful at the moment so tell us a little bit about about your thoughts on that as well um Again, my in-hand work came from Turbo. Um, so, I mean, dear of them, I've got a lot to, to thank them for. They trained me, you know, really, really well when I was younger and I'm very grateful. Um, I used to love, with Maestro, my old horse, I used to love doing in-hand work more than I used to like riding him. I used to love riding him, but he was just so clever. And I could see, I could see a lot more on the ground. I've never been a rider that has, I've, I've got feel in the sense that I can tell whether something's right or wrong, but um, I can see it much better than I can feel it. Um, so I find that when I'm on the ground, I can make smaller adjustments um, and make those little fine tune adjustments to get to the end result a little bit quicker than if I have taken that longer route through. Um, so what I do now is I use a lot of the groundwork and the in-hand work that we used to do with the Lucy partners there um, on everyday horses. So We've got a little cob um, here at the moment who's on livery. Um, and I met him last summer and he was really short and choppy, very, very upright. He's a, like a traditional gypsy cob, he's beautiful. Very short neck, um, really upright in the shoulder, very, very tight short neck. Beautiful little horse, he tries really hard. Um, had a physio come out, Nicky came out and, um, and saw him for, uh, for my friend Claire who owns him. Um, and he was very tight through his shoulder, obviously, and very tight through his neck. So she did some exercises, gave us some stretching work for that. Um, and then said, we need to get him lifting through the shoulder. So we've got um, a little round pen at home. We haven't got enough space for a school, but we've got a little round pen, which is a real godsend. Um, and I've got some cavaletti that I got for Christmas last year. Um, and so what we've been doing is just walking him in hand over the cavaletti poles set at different heights. So you know, sometimes we might put them all on the ground and sometimes they might be up higher and then we might alternate them. And he just has to walk in hand. And the reason being is that it's just to improve his proprioception. And um, we move them. So sometimes we put them across the school. So he's got to come across on the turn and then use it. He's not allowed to rush. So when he first started doing this, he used to get really short. He used to kind of go right up underneath the pole and then lift up because lifting up tight with his shoulder was what he was used to doing. That was his normal way of moving. So what we noticed was that if we slowed him right down, this is just in the walk, if we slowed him right down, he was starting to get to the point where he, instead of putting that little short one in, he might take the option of lifting and opening the shoulder a little bit more. So he was starting to give us um, a more of a lift and an open through the shoulder. If we sped the walk up, he went back to his automatic, I'm going to go shorter and I'm going to put in that little extra stride. Now this might sound quite familiar for people when they're jumping. There's so many people I've seen, they go, oh, he always sticks that little short one in, okay? Because they've just, that's their natural way of going. And, you know, that's their go-to. So if they get a little nervous, they think, oh, hang on, go back to what I'm used to. They put a little short one in and then you get that horrible jolt before you get the jump. So what we've done with him is we've taken it right back to basics. Um, and we've done the same with the Welsh pony as well. So we've got a little Welsh pony here who's very tight in the neck. She's been a kid's pony. She's a fantastic kid's pony. Um, she's had loads of fun. But she's done it like this. So she's done it with her head up in the air and she's really used this muscle under here. She's not used her top line at all. Um, and she's been quite strong because of that. So what we've done with her is we've taken her right back to basics and we've tried to explain to her that she has to lift through her core and use her top line and then soften the underside of her neck. Um, and again, we've done that using uh, Tilly, my stepdaughter. She's 12. She goes round um, on an evening. She was doing it after school. Just walking her around um, and every time we got to a pole Fanta would want to jump she'd want to leap over the pole or she'd want to rush and speed up so we've had to just say to her we're still going to walk over it you know unless we walk over it 40 times we're still going to walk over it we're not jumping over it 
to the point now that she's the same. She can lift and she can open through the shoulder a lot better. And she's not getting to that pole and thinking, oh God, I've got to jump over it. She's getting to the pole and just lifting and, and using herself. Um, so that's one of the biggest things that we've been doing recently. Um, but that's quite different from my in-hand background that I had at Turbo. Um, it started really because when I was at university, I was at Hartbury with uh, my horse, my stride took him with me. Um, and he had some problems. We didn't really know what it was, whether it was his feet or his back. We He went for a full body scan and he showed up with some uptake in his front feet, but also in his spine. So they were umming and ahhing, which was causing which. Of course, normally it starts with the feet, so it was the feet. But um, we sorted him out some remedial shoeing. And then my physio said to me, it'd be really good if we learned to do Piaf. And I'm like, well, hang on a minute. This horse has had all this time off. It's a little bit, we're going straight up there, <laughs> straight up to the top level. We're missing all the other levels. And, and she said, it's, it's more the movement that he needs to do. He needs to sit on the back end and elevate the front end. So she said, that's the understanding that he needs to do. Obviously not go straight into Duke Cap. Um, so again, I took him back to the best person I know, which is Diane Thurman Baker at Turville and said, my horse is broken. Can you help me fix it? So we started off slowly um, and just doing groundwork and doing a little bit of lateral work. Um, so asking them to leg yield and shoulder in, um, travers on the circle. And then we started to introduce the track to him. And he was pretty quick on the uptake. He got it quite quickly. Um, not with me, because I'm just rubbish at it, but Diane was really quick on the aid and managed to get it perfectly. Um, I took a little bit longer to to be able to do it with him. He used to run past me quite a lot, whereas he didn't move with her. He was perfect. Um, so I went from having a horse who was the year before going to be put down because they weren't quite sure. He was so hopping lane. They weren't sure what they were going to do with him. To the year after we had him with Diane doing the groundwork to him going off and winning um, at the breed show, the ridden park red class. Um, and the he never had a big, he had an avicular as uh, we found out a lot later on. But he never had a big stride. Um, he was always quite short and choppy, quite upright in his feet. A lot of Lusos tend to be. Um, but what we did find with the Piaf work, because it made him sit a little bit more, he elevated the front end and he actually won the class because of his medium top, which is, uh, uh, you know, unheard of really for a horse that couldn't really chop. So um, it just goes to show that if you do the right work and you do it slowly, um, you really can make a huge difference in quite a short period of time. But it's not about rushing it. It's about taking it slowly, taking your time, um, you know, going to somebody who can teach you. There's plenty of really decent instructors around. Um, most of them have come from Turbo, um, because they really do. They learn from the best. They learn from the Valencias in Portugal. So they learn from the best. Um, and it's just brilliant. It's, it's such a good thing to be able to do with your horse. And you can see from the ground. I do it with the Welsh pony, who's 12 hands. I do it with Lenny, who's 16 too. Um, you know, we do it with the youngsters. So all of our youngsters will do in hand work um, before they're even bitten back to just do that on the halter, just to, so that they understand the principle of moving away from the pressure. Um, I can't stand something that jumps on top of you. Um, I've been mounted by a stallion before, I broke my leg in five places. So it's not something I really want to go back and relive again. So uh, everything of ours has to stand out the way. Uh, it has to move away from the pressure, it has to move back. So to ask you a question then on a personal note, because something you said there really resonated, I've got, um, some of you will know, I've got a nine-year-old Irish sports horse, big honking great lad who's finally finished growing now. We are at BD Novice and he doesn't have a medium um, yet. I know he's got it in him, but he's having to learn to take his weight back more and to stay straight in order to get it. So um, obviously I can't be doing any of this at the moment because I can't go and see him. But when I am able to go and see him, what can I be thinking about doing with him then to help sit him back a bit more to get that elevation through the shoulder and some some better medium strides from him then perhaps? Is um, there something I can be doing in hand? Yeah. yeah, there's loads of things you can be doing in hand. So. Um, what I'm going to do in the course that we're putting out, I will um, go through the basis. So I'm going to start with the general lunging, for how to lunge, how I would lunge. Um, and then I would move you into the general in hand work. So you start the in hand work. It's more like a, a shoulder in with a higher angle to begin with. And then you take it into a leg yield. So you can go straighter and you move into a leg yield. Then you can go into a true shoulder in. So again, it gives you the vision from the ground to be able to see what the shoulder in is, because a lot of people don't know what free tracks is, but when you're on the ground with the horse, you can actually see the free tracks. Um, and then you can go, oh, okay, actually it's a lot less angle than I thought it was when I was up there riding. 
So, and, and then from the shoulder in, we then take you and we open the shoulders a little bit more and we start to move them into a, a leg yield, then moving into a, a travers. So this is what's gonna really help your horse because as he builds through, you're starting to say to him, yield the hindquarters, yield the shoulders. So once you learn to yield the shoulders, he then has to sit more on the hindquarters. So then he's starting to lighten the shoulder and open the shoulder a bit more because you can't open the shoulder if you're heavy on it. You have to sit back away from it slightly. So you can then open the shoulder um, and you know really sit on those hindquarters. Things like the rain back, you know, the rain back, um, for the working equitation, I actually learned completely differently to how I was taught when I was younger. So, you know, I always believe that you can learn something, um, even if it's what you don't want to do. So that's why I'm so open to learning and being taught because I don't profess to know everything. I know very little, but I'm really, really willing to learn. Um, and I've been taught to do the rain back in many different ways, but one of the ways that I learned recently with the working equitation was to do it very gently just off the rein. Um, and when I didn't interfere with my legs, my horses stayed a lot straighter. I also then had the ability to then move the horse later on with my leg. And I've always put my legs back to do a rein back and come forward slightly, because that's always the way I've been taught. Um, and for another example with Nikki and her rein back, she was struggling because Freddie was wiggling. Um, and we went back and said, okay, let's do it the way that I was taught for the working equitation. And he goes straight back, straight as a die. And that's another thing that you can do on the ground. So when you're doing groundwork, you haven't got your legs there. So you're just asking the horse to move from the pressure so that if you teach them to go straight and to get the clear diagonals in the rain back, again, it gets them sitting a little bit more. And then you can push them up and forwards and get them to push from behind so that they're pushing forwards and they're more elevated through the shoulder. Um, you can then move on to something like the Spanish walk. You could teach them the Spanish walk. Um, we've done that with Lenny, um, the Clydesdale, because she was very tight in the shoulder. Again, she's another one that's pulled with the, I mean, they're designed to pull Clydes, aren't they? So they're designed to push into a, into a harness and really pull something. So her shoulders are always down. Um, she's got very, very long back legs. Um, so for her confirmation, trying to get her up in front then puts extra pressure on the hindquarters. So what we've had to do with her is teach her the Spanish walk very slowly so she can lift her core. Um, and she now gets a much better canter strike off when she lifts her shoulder. So we might do a little bit of short, uh, Spanish walk to help her. Um, it's more like a Spanish stomp with her because she's got massive great feet and she stomps them down like she's having a tantrum. But we've taught um, Quinn the, the cob I was telling you about, the one with the really tight shoulders. We've taught him the Spanish walk as well. And he's gone from just literally being able to lift his leg up and down like this to being able to really open up and stretch through the shoulder. Um, and I'm, you know, for us, it's just so nice to be able to see it on the ground because we can go, oh, we didn't have that last time. You know, we've, we've got another inch or, or something. And, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I've had injuries in the past where I've had my shoulders and things, and I know how long that they take to heal. So from a horse that's done something for six years of its life in a certain way, it's not going to undo it very, very quickly. You have to you know, give it time. So for you, with regards to your horse, you now know that he's got that strength. You can start doing that in handwork with him, get him understanding, get him moving, so that when you then ask him when you're riding him, it's going to be a lot easier. I always explain the medium trot a little bit like a seesaw. It was the easiest way somebody explained it to me once. Um, is that with a horse, when you're um, coming into the medium trot, your horse is a bit like this. And sometimes you might get too much power and the front end comes up or you get too much the front end and then the back end comes up and you've, you've lost your power. And you've got to go from this to this to this. And I always used to find that I kind of, if I could get it to like this and I'd be like, sometimes it was down, sometimes it was up, I'd get it right. And then I'd go into my medium and I could go a bit like a wheelie. You almost want to be able to put the power on from behind and elevate the front end. Because I don't know about you, but a lot of people with medium trot goes like this. <laughs> they end up going into the ground. So, you know, I, that's the way I thought about it. And, you know, with Lenny, for example, you'll see um, little videos that we've put on. She's six this year, so she's not very old, but she's, she's got a cracking medium trot in there. I just can't, I can't hold it all. Um, my stomach muscles are far, far inferior to her medium trot. So uh, we do a little bit. So we do a little bit of on and then a little bit of back and then a little bit of on and a little bit of back so that she gets the praise for going forwards and elevated. And then I bring her back before we get to the point where we kind of dive into a heap on the floor. Um, and then I can praise her for what she's got right 
rather than having to think, oh God, we did it wrong again. So I try to, I don't tend to um, tell them off when they've done something wrong. I tend to ignore it and then praise them for the good. So I try and reduce the amount of things they get wrong um, by setting it up in such a way that they succeed. And then you praise for, this, for them for the success because otherwise um, they're like kids. They just get fed up. If, if they're always doing something wrong, they think, well, I'm not going to be doing it anyway. So. So that's and just like humans as well, human motivation. We are, although we are massively pushed away from things that we don't like, we're we're very very drawn to the things that we do. We want to get that gratification. We want wins. That's why big goals sometimes are too big, and little ones are great because we can tick them off. So yeah, absolutely, I love that. So thank you very much. I will definitely be um, learning from your course. Um, so that'll be out fairly soon, won't it? The, in hand, yeah. and it will just be looking at lots of different things you can do in hand with your horse for a purpose, not just kind of like waving sticks and bits of string for the sake of it. It's very much <laughs> how to help your dressage, like I just said there, how to improve a particular movement, how to get better with something, how to help your horse get stronger, and that kind of stuff. So, yours is more about, uh, if I'm right here, yours is more about in hand work for improving the horse um, and helping you with things as opposed to the rehab sort of side of stuff. But of course, all it's all good, isn't it? You know, it's all good. Yeah. You, you've got to be careful, obviously if you've got a horse with an injury um you have to be careful and make sure that you consult your vet or your physio and work with them to get a plan um but you will probably find that if you've got a little bit of knowledge about this sort of thing and you've started to work with your horses anyway and they're used to doing the in-hand work maybe just once or twice a week um then it means that if they do end up having an injury you can then use that because their body is used to moving in that way you can then use it in the future so you're kind of almost preparing them to be able to um, rehab easier later on if something does happen rather than getting to the point where something happens and then you're thinking oh I better start now so it's about keeping it's a bit about keeping you fit and strong it's a bit like a Pilates class for a horse really you, you do it every week so that if you do hurt yourself you can then get much um, fitter much quicker again cool thank you so much and so that's going to be a course that's out soon so we'll let people know when that is out and also cassie you're going to put a link to your page you've got two you haven't you? you've got cassie gatsby equine coaching is that right i think we'll put it in when we and then you've got cassie gatsby platting so if someone starts looking for you so just really quickly tell us a little bit about how you got into i mean not just platting we're not just talking just platting here like the things you can do with a horse's <laughs> hair front and back is it's just mind-blowing so tell us very briefly what it was that means that you do this platting what you do and what you want to teach other people well again um it started at Turbo. everything starts at Turbo. it's honestly it's the best place in the world and um, i used to um help out there when i was a kid and then it went on to to work in there and we used to have people come for classical lessons and things. So horses would have a lot of hair. Um, and I don't know if you're, if you've ever ridden in a double bridle, but if you're trying to ride in a double bridle for the first time and you've got a load of hair, it's not a good combination. <laughs> so, so what we used to do is we'd quickly stick a, a running plait in their manes just to allow the rider to be able to, you know, concentrate on learning how to feel the double reins and feel the movement of the horse and things um, without having to worry about all this hair flying around um, because it can get in the way. Um, so we used to stick crest plaques in really, really quickly. Um, and then when I was a kid, we used to do courses. Um, and at the end of every course, you'd get uh, a Gymkhana day. So you'd have to plait your ponies up and you'd bath your ponies in the morning and you'd plait them all up. And then your parents would come in the afternoon and you'd be there. I mean, I'm sure we thought we all looked fabulous, but I do. I have seen pictures and I had bows and all sorts going on. It was not a good look. Um, I used to have a pony that I rode called Sparky who had an allergy. And we used to put um, some tights over his nose. Um, before you had like little nose nets um, and I remember going out to the market with my mum when I was a kid and trying to find like the prettiest bow, like ones with bows on this poor pony and I'd like tied it to his, his nose band um, but you know it was all about the turnout on the last day and you'd get marked every day out of five for things like tacking up and grooming and and how you'd been in your lessons and stuff and it was if you could get you know your yourself onto that there was like there was five places um on the um you know stable management you used to win prizes in the gymkhana but everybody wants to be on the stable management one and i remember one year i'd i'd done quite well i've got i can see them up here actually my mom i'm in my mom's house and i've got my mom in my rosettes and stuff um but i have got three three of the champion ones and i do you know what they are probably the most important rosettes <laughs> i've got all these other ones for like things like royal cornwall and stuff like that but those three i worked really hard for those <laughs> 
um so it was that's where it started was you know having that you know being a little kid and having the aspiration to be as good as those people that got in that top five I wanted to be that person that got that big red red and blue and white rosette you know I wanted to be the champion I wanted to get that for looking after my horse for being um, you know good at tackling for being good at turning out and all that sort of thing um I was probably a bit sad a bit nerdy but um I remember once I've got a, a little trophy here somewhere I got 100 percent I for the whole course I got um I, I got five out of five on everything and I got 100 percent and um do you know what that memory I was probably about nine ten I don't know eleven and that memory has not left me um and it's still one of the biggest things that I'm proud of because I, I remember how long it took me to get to that point to, to achieve that. And that may sound really silly, um, but it is something quite, you know, trivial in the whole scheme of things. But when you're that age, that is massively important to you. So, you know, never, ever, um, you know, tell people that they can't do it. I, I, you know, whoever you are, you've got dodgy hands, whatever, you can give it a go and have fun. And that's the thing that I love about um, platting. And one of the reasons, I mean, I'm not the best platter. There's plenty of people out there that can plat quicker than me, that can plat neater than me. Um, but I love it. I really, really enjoy it. And I love teaching other people to do it um, because it gives people time to bond with their horse. Um, and, you know, there's nothing better than going to a show and looking absolutely spanking and being able to ride around and go, I did this and I look good and I deserve to be <laughs> a bit like Nadia the other day with her overconfidence in the ring I loved that um that made me smile so much because I've had um I was lucky enough to ride at Royal Cornwall a couple of times none of which have been on my horses I've stolen a couple of friends horses each time um and I rode I think it was a couple of years ago now um 2018 I think on a friend's horse he's an old boy um and do you know what he looked absolutely stunning he does he, she will probably say when he's a mud monster in the field he doesn't look anything special he goes a funny yellow color and he loves to be filthy um and she bathed him with an inch of his life we plastered him up that day and we stuck the portuguese tack on and do you know what i've never been so proud i rode around that arena going i own this because he just looked amazing and that's the best thing i love people to have that feeling I love watching people when we've done their horses for them at Windsor and things and they are riding around that arena beaming because they haven't had to worry about um you know platting their horse up on that stressful day I mean the most stressful thing if you've ever ridden in Spanish gear is trying to get into the Polenas so the Polenas are like the chaps honestly um my friend Lynn comes with me and she comes purely to do the Polenas up because they're the most awkward thing to get up on and then trying to get the spurs on oh it's a right fast so um, you see, that's another reason to get a loose tonic because you don't have to worry about it anymore. <laughs> so, um, but it is is good fun, and you know I love going to shows. Like I said to you, I had a really nasty accident um, a few years ago, and I was riding quite a lot, and uh, that changed my life quite a lot. I, I can't ride as well or as much as I did. Um, you know, I, I'm on painkillers a lot, and I struggle with my um, my leg, um, but. I missed all my friends, like I said to you, living in Cornwall. Um, I didn't see everybody that we used to see all the time. Um, and the only place that us guys get together, where we all get together, are the shows. So we have the big ones, like the Lucio Breed show. We have the Spanish um, show, the GB Prix show at Hartbury every year. Um, we have IPS, which I think you went to, Jenny, um, which is the one down at Maris Wood. That's an amazing show. We have the Southwest Siberian show, which... Um, is the one down near us which is uh, in Devon that's an amazing show if you ever get a chance to come there the parties there are top quality <laughs> um, but it is the only place where you know only time of year I think we get like I think it's probably about five six maybe seven shows a year where we all get together um, so when um, I had my accident I was a bit like well I can't go to shows I can't ride um, so one of my friends said to me well I'm going to the show and I'm terrified will you come and plat my horse for me um, and then I did her horse and then it went on to another horse and then it went on from there. Um, and then it got to the point where I was like, well, actually, I could go to these shows and not have to pay to go to the shows because <laughs> because people could pay me to plat. And then I could actually pay. I still don't make I don't make much out of it. I, I pretty much uh, break even. But Lynn and I, for example, my friend Lynn, who um, comes with me to all the shows, 
she is a hogger she's a serial hogger so I do have to keep her away from a lot of these lovely horses but she <laughs> holds on to them um she does the, the best holding and I know that seems like a really insignificant job but it's the most important job if you know I've asked my husband to hold horses he has rubbish rubbish yeah they have them moving all over the place Lynn can hold a horse she holds it exactly where I need it but I can just go and flat it up really quickly and job done four o'clock in the morning she's up with me um she's fabulous she's telling me I haven't charged my head torch when I'm out there in the stable trying to get it working so she gets the head torch charged she's brilliant um I'd be lost without her but she it means that for example we go to Royal Windsor and we go the day before we have a wander around and we go and watch the parade in the evening um and that's really good the pageant thing we watch that in the evening and then we stay over and then we get up at the crack of dawn and we work absolutely solidly all day on the Sunday because that's when the Iberian classes are we stagger to the car um at the end of the Sunday and then we drive back to Cornwall but it's meant that normally what we've earned on the day has covered our costs it's covered our hotel and our fuel um and usually gets us to go and see the pageant as well so you know it's not anything that's going to make me a millionaire but it means I get to go and see my friends um and that's the best thing in the world really because it means I get to go and see everybody I love them all they're they're all fantastic um I've met some amazing people from platting um and I wouldn't have met them otherwise so it's a really really good way for me to be able to go around um and have a jolly basically <laughs> um uh, and I think if it didn't pay for itself my husband wouldn't let me go uh, because he has to look after the kids for the weekend but um but it's really good fun but I also really love to teach people to flat because it's great that like, you know you have to look the part when you're out there you spend so much time on the training and the clothes and everything else for it to not be finished properly is such a letdown so you know you have to to do it and anyone can do it I've got some of the kids that come along are brilliant I've had um you know people with two left hands that really can't do it we find them something that they can do you know something that they can do um that means that they can turn their horse out and we work away so some people for example really struggle with threading so we teach them how to band and we teach them things like different types of bands there's there's so many different types of bands out there silicon ones and then like non-snap bands and then ones that say they're non-snap bands but they do snap and all this sort of thing and then products when you use products some products make band snap you know little things like that it's it's Little things that I've learned along the way that I know don't use that plat spray with that type of band because it makes it snap, you know, and there's nothing worse than putting in a lovely set of plaits and, you know, say you can't sew, for example, you put them all in with bands, so it's not a problem. Um, and then you finish spray them. If you use the wrong finish spray, the bands go, pop, 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 <laughs> they all fall out. I've been yeah. there, done that one, learned that one. I'm really, I'm so interested now. I cannot wait to see your plotting course just so I can check if I'm using the right products with the right. So I like a good silicon band because they stretch a long way. Yeah. Um, I will sew in if I absolutely have to, I will sew in. But generally for dressage, I use a bobby pin. So yeah. I sew it and then I push oh. a bobby pin in yeah. so I can get a nice big rosette. For showing, obviously, I sew them. And then for anything else in between, I'll use a band. But I'm really intrigued now if I'm actually using the right product with the right yeah. time. So anyway, look, we're, we've gone way over the hour now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's great. You're so passionate and everyone's been saying on the chat, you know, it's lovely. You're so passionate. I want to know more about that and things. So people want to know more about in hand. People want to have a go with the working equitation. Um, I know people are going to want to know more about platting and especially now that we know there's a bit of science. Like, oh, yeah. you know, now we need now we need to know, are we using the right product combination? I mean, quite frankly, you know, the old bit of water on a body brush, it just doesn't cut it nowadays, does it? So, it. you know, <laughs> even even your experience of all the different types of things that we can have is amazing. So I can't wait for that course to come out. Um, they are nearly done now, aren't they? They're about to be launched fairly soon on horsey courses. Honestly, my poor husband, he's had to video all of them and he's like, you're going to sew more in? <laughs> Why do you sew them in? <laughs> That is brilliant. I love it. And it's so cool that everyone's coming together and, and, and helping each other out in this in this time and, and what have you. So that's great. But thank you so much for sharing your passion, sharing your thoughts. We didn't even get on to mindset today. Like we just heard so much about so many other things. So maybe at some point, Cassie, we'll do another chat about particularly about how you have managed to pivot. I hope you know, I've been using that word so much, haven't I? But how you managed to find out what was really important to you, what your values were and 
you thought about what you really loved and what you really enjoyed when something came along the way and you're able to fill that in a different way because really that's so important to know what's important to you what you love what you adore that's I just I love what I do because I get to go to the shows as well and you know my husband always says well have a nice holiday and I'm like I'm working I'm working and he's like well it's not really working though is it yeah working and I'm like well it's not my fault that I've created a career around my passion you know you want to do that off you go have fun so um you know it I think it's great that you've done that and it just shows that if you know yourself and you know what you love and you know what you that drives you on if you if you are also able to at least cover the costs even if it's not you know making an income making an income is even better um then that's great so thank you so much cassie it's been absolutely lovely i'm sure there'll be loads more questions from you especially when people watch the replay of this and listen to the podcast um we'll put any links or anything in won't we to yourself and to things like working equitation to um, where people can find out where all these shows are. I can't wait for the Southwestern one. I'm, book, I'm booking my B&B in Devon as soon as I can. What time of year is it normally? September. The first oh, good. September. It might still oh, happen. God. Yeah, I know. We're on. We're on. <laughs> so that sounds great fun. Um, so, yeah, so the little, the Flying Changes crew will no doubt be, uh, be out uh, partying everywhere we yeah. can as soon as we're allowed out. Yeah, we can get them all come in. <laughs> Fab. Thank you so much, Cassie. Is there anything else you just wanted to add at the end or are we, no. we're happy to finish there? Thank you very much for listening and I'm sorry I jabbered on. <laughs> no, it's lovely. I would have stopped you if I thought you were jabbering on, but it was all really interesting and, and people have loved it. So, right. Take care. Thank you so much, Cassie. And see you guys and hear, you hope you guys hear us all again in something soon.